So this is uh, test five of your chemistry. Um, we're going over some of the questions from chapter seven and chapter eight combined, which is on light and on the periodic um, chemistry mm -hmm. table, the periodic table. <clears throat> so number one, what are the individual packets or quanta? We're talking about quantum, right? Of light energy. What are these little packets called? There's another name for them, and they're called photons, P-H-O-T-O-N-S. What can amplitude, let's see, what can amplitude of a wave be considered a measure of? Amplitude is the height of the wave, and it's a measure of the strength of the wave. If the wavelength of a light wave decreases, how must its frequency change? As the wavelength come, becomes big, its frequency becomes small. As the wavelength becomes very little, its frequency um, becomes um, very high. So if the wave is going to decrease, the frequency is going to increase. Number four, what does light consist of? Well, we know that light, had, in the beginning, they thought that light was just particles. Isaac Newton said they're particles. And then we had the waves. So now we know they're both waves and particles. So um, what does light consist of? Electromagnetic waves and photons, which are particles. Both, they're both. Who developed um, the periodic table of elements? The Russian guy, Dmitri. Dmitri Mendeleev. Dmitri Mendeleev. What is the maximum number of um, valence atom, and electrons in an atom may have? They may have up to eight. Remember, you have the X here with it. Let's see if it's on here. Let me make sure I'm on here. So, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay, on to number seven here. What unit is, uh, is wave frequency usually measured in? What do you measure the frequency frequencies of waves in hertz? especially sound waves, are in hertz. And also um, measured in light, too. What do, lines to, what do lines to the hydrogen spectrum represent? So when you have a hydrogen um, spectrum, those li lines are telling you what? They're telling you um, that the photons admitted drop from the higher to the lower. So when the photons drop to an energy, a lower energy level. The photons are electron packets. And when they drop to an, a lower energy level, then they give off energy. And that's what photons do. So photons emitted drop from a higher to a lower energy level. B. Okay, let's see, I'm just make sure I'm on here right. Okay. Which of the following categories consists of elements that usually exist at uh, two plus ions. So you're looking at those categories, categories here uh, of the periodic table, and you'll see um, categories one, two, this categories of the two in line two, what are they called? They're um, called alkaline earth metals. Those are in column two. And they're all, they all usually uh, exist as plus two ions. Column one is plus one ion. Okay, what does the magnetic quantum number describe? The magnetic quantum number would describe the or or um, orbital orientation. This will be a test question because all of these are about the quantum numbers. So um, the, the, there's quantum numbers. The first number, N, is the principal number. And then we have um, M being that, um, <laughs> actually being that orientation number. You have MS being the spin those numbers, remember? Okay. So let's go on to the next page. Should just kind of go along here. So let's see if I want to get these on here right. Kind of a little bit crooked. Anyway. Number 11. What does the principal quantum number describe? The principal quantum number is that N number. Remember I said N then they have S, and they have a little thing like that. So N is the principal, and that's the electron shell. So this is the electron shell. 
This is the subshell, which is usually an S or a P or a D. It tells the shape of the cell. That's the second quantum number. And then um, this little two tells how many electrons are left in, are, are in that, or even at the end, how many electrons are left. So, so but what does the principal quantum number end set is the electron shell. What is the lowest energy state of an atom called? Ground. Ground level is the lowest state, ground state. Number 13. Okay, now let's look at those elements again. So the elements in column one, I don't know if you can see this that well, but column one is this column here, first column. What do you call those elements? The elements in column one are called alkali metals. You need to know these. The elements in column two are called what? Column two is this going to be the second column here. And those um, elements are going to be called alkaline earth metals. Now the elements in column 17, 17 would be the column, um, the second to the last column, this last column here, number 17, they're called halogens. Halogens mean salt. So they're the, they're the ones that turn to salt. You know, like sodium chloride is table salt and, chloride, and chlorine's in that group. So they're called halogens. And they usually combine, halogens combine really well with column one, the alkali metals. These two combine like really well. So number 16, the elements in column 18, that's the very last column, very last column here in column 18. Those ones in the last column are called noble gases because they don't, they're full up or full up of their electrons and they rarely change. They're pretty stable, so they rarely react with anything. Elements in columns one and two and 13 through 18. So you have these elements on this side and these all elements on this side. What are they all? They all call, they're called the main group elements. They're main groups. Those are the main group. Just knowing about the periodic table. Number 18, which of the following elements is a from, from a group that really undergo uh, chemical reactions. Which of the following elements is from a group that rarely undergo, <laughs> that said really, rarely undergo chemical reactions? I just told you that. What are those called? They're called noble. And so you look in this last column here. You have this periodic table on, on the back of your test. So just look at it and you see the last column here. And you look and see which one of these are in this last column. And if you look, you'll see, you'll see which one are in, in, in um, number 18 column you'll see argon is. See, I'll see if I can see down here. I don't have very good light here. Argon would be the third. One, two, three, argon. Anything in this column is called the noble gas. And that's in that eight, column 18. So they rarely go through any chemical reaction. Argon doesn't. Which is the probable formula of bromide of beryllium. So what I had to do is look up those two and basically see where they were. So look on your, this is when you have to look on their periodic table right here. And so you look at beryllium as BE. See if I can see it on here. It's kind of small, beryllium. And here's BE right here. And it's in the second column. It's right at the top of the second column, BE. So you know that's gonna be positive two. So you know this is going to be positive 2. And then um, you're going to look at bromine, which is um, going to be, uh, let's see, bromine is going to be um, 2. I'm trying to find it here, right here. It's clear over here. You see it? It is right there. Okay. So basically, you're going to need two of these because this is a, this is going to be just one. It's a it's a actually um, one negative number. So in one negative, and this is going to be two positive. So you're going to need two of those to match up. So a Be Br two. So that's how you do that one. You have to look just look them up, and you say this one is in the second column. It's two positive, and this is a, this is actually in, in the halogen, which is just a negative one. And so you need two of these to match up with that one. So one's the alcohol on earth and one is the halogen. 
And this has two positives, one positive, and that's how I learned to do that one. Okay, let's get in kind of centered here so I don't, okay. Which of the following categories includes nitrogen, oxygen, chlorine, and krypton? Okay, so um, nitrogen, you look on, look on your thing, you'll see nitrogen, where is nitrogen and oxygen? Nitrogen's here, oxygen's here, and um, what was the other one? Um, chlorine, chlorine's here, and krypton's here. So what do you see? They're all over on this side. The metals are on this side, and the non-metals are on this side. So they will be non-metals. They're all on that on the right side, non-metals. Which of the following is not an alkali metal? So you have these alkaline metals, and you'll go down this line and see which one um, which one is not not in this first category. And you'll find calciums in the second row. Which one's not in this row in this group? And only one. That's so easy. Calcium. Just look at your, keep your periodic table there right in front of you. A chemist reacts chlorine gas with potassium to form potassium chloride, which consists of potassium, uh, positive potassium, and chloride uh, ions. Which of the following properties of chlorine is most important to this reaction? So when you're talking about ions, you're talking about electrons. So electron infinity, that's because it's gonna add one electron. Now. This one is kind of a harder question, so I don't know if you really, you know, I almost got this, that one wrong. Okay, number 23. Which of the following ions would you expect to require the least energy to form in alkali metals? Which would be the least energy to form? So when I said the least energy, you look through those categories. Now I had a time with here, but the least energy because it goes from um, it goes like this. The, the, the chart goes actually it goes from um, large to small, right, over to large. So it's large to small over to large. So which would be which would be the least? And as you look there, it would be. Um, um, basically, it's sodium. And this one I had a question on too. I, I, I don't really know. Look on your question. I think I might have copied that wrong. I'm not sure. So look at that question. Which of the following is a halogen? Halogen, of course. What are halogen? They're over here in this um, aisle 17. <laughs> so here's aisle 18, aisle 17. So these are, these are halogens here. So the saying which one is in here and you look through and you see which one is in, in is a halogen? Iodine is, so iodine's in that row. So you look at the, just look at the row and you have iodine. You got your periodic table there, it's pretty easy. What is the correct Lewis symbol for phosphorus? So phosphorus had um, a seven atomic number minus um, two shells, so Basically, I had phosphorus, but you know what? I'm not sure if that is totally right. Um, yeah, I would say there's two shells. Seven minus two is five, so one, two, three, four, five. How many valence electrons does a boron have? So how many valence electrons does boron have? So I looked at the atomic number and you got the, the atomic number of, at the top being five, so I'm minus two, so I just said three. Because you always have to take two. Why do you have to minus two on these? I always min minus two because the first shell is gonna be S2, is gonna be full, and then the next shell will be, um, whether it's S or P, usually S, and it's going to be S or um, P, I'm sorry, P5 because there's seven, one, two, seven electrons. So, and then this one would be the same way. Boron has uh, five, so it's going to be filled up till you get to the last one. And the last, whether it's P5, you know, um, if it's, or it's P, it's the atomic number is five, you gotta subtract two. So I just put three, okay? 
Which of the following statements best explains why knowing electron location on the periodic table? So which one? Well, knowing electron location on the periodic table is important because of what? Because the electron configuration determines what the atoms are going to do. It determines everything about their chemical behavior. So um, you can put that down, see. 28. Which of the following categories includes vanadium, platinum, and gold? Well, they all are in that middle area, aren't they? If you look on your periodic table, they're all going to be in this middle area. And what's this middle area called? These are the these are over here are going to be called the main, the main group, and the middle area are going to be called transition uh, metals. They're transition metals. Gold, silver, they're all in the middle there, transition metals. Astronom ast astronomers, see here. Astronomers can study the elemental com composition of stars by observing the spectrum of light of star and comparing it to the spectra of elements on the Earth. So what laboratory device will they're going to use? Well, they're going to use the same that we use to find out any element, what it is. It's called a spectrometer, and you put it through, and it'll have a spectrum, a line spectrum, and the lights will show up in this line like that, all different things. You know, the lines come through like that, like a spectrometer. Which of the following elements would you expect to have the greatest electronegative? Okay, see here how I put down here? So when I write, and you can put this on your paper too, okay? That shows, that you're, that shows how you're thinking. So what I always put, you know, um, so electronegatively is opposite from um, how, big the, how big the atoms are. So it goes from large to small and then to large. And so then I found all of these and I found out where each one of these are. So lithium, if you take lithium, lithium's clear over to the, lithium's clear over, it, it is uh, um, alkali, so it's clear over on the left side. And then um, B, B is, um, let's see, just found it, B, E. And so um, barium and, and fluoride is way over on the right side. So fluorine's, fluoride's way over on this side. And then um, the rest of them are lithium, barium, B, and boron, let's see. Here's barium right here on this side. So it's on this side too. So barium is right, the B is right there, or BA is right there. So where's the B? Alrighty, let's find the B. It's taking me a little bit, sorry. Fluoride is way over here. Mm -hmm. So. Hmm. Yeah, sorry. So where is the B? Let's see. Oh, I can't see it on this, but look it up on yours. You'll see it on yours. But anyway, as you look these up, it goes from large to small. So they want to know what is uh, the elements that you expect to have the greatest or the largest. Well, because um, fluorine is clear over on this side. It's small to large. I would say CF because it's way over on this side, where the large side is. What is the electrical con uh, configuration of silicon? So, uh, so you look on your um, table, and you'll see that silicon. This is actually a harder question because look at this. Look at that. You're gonna think, what the heck is that? Basically, you want to be concerned with this last part, this last number. So, um, silicon has um, 14 electrons, and neon has 10 electrons. So, 14 minus 10 is four more electrons. But if you have four more electrons, you have to take two off for the S right here, right? So you have to take two off, and so what do you have left? Two. So the last has to be P2. So you understand that? Because if you looked in there, silicon has 14, and then neon, of course you want neon, you took neon, you subtract that from it because that's the configuration that's there. Neon has 10. So you subtract and you have four, that's what I did. And then you have to minus two for that, for this one here, and then you have two left. Hope you can figure that one out.
how many valence electrons does 10 have? You know what the number 10 is? What the letter 10? 10, 10 is Sn. So look in your periodic table there, and you'll see, um, you'll see how many in that group. You look at what group it's in. So here's my periodic table again. So what group is it in? And you'll see 10, 10, 10, 10, 10 is in the carbon, where the carbon group is, right here, this group. Oh, these are so small, I can't tell, but this carbon group here, this is 10, 10 is S9. So it's in this carbon group. So we look in that carbon group there, and we'll see in the carbon group is a four valent, valence, right? And you'll look, look on your periodic table and you'll see that. So you'll see where 10, in the line that 10 is, is in that. And so basically, um, since carbon is four, has four, 10 is that same, all of them have the same, and it's gonna be four. Which of the following compounds is a product of the reaction between lithium and water? So to lithium hydroxide. Just remember hydroxy is this OH, and it's always negative, one negative. Well, lithium combines with um, water, and so then it forms hydroxide, which is OH, and it gets rid of hydrogen. So that's lithium plus H2O is LiOH negative and plus, um, plus hydrogen. So I think that's your, what you have there. Basically, you're going to have um, this, this here is what they're looking at. What is the probable formula of fluoride of nitrogen? Well, fluoride is a halogen, and it needs one. It needs one. Um, it needs it needs um, one to fill up, one electron to fill up, right? And then N it needs three to fill up. I got that from the periodic table because you'll see N is right here, and Fluoride is right here, so this one needs, it's, it's seven, seven, so it needs one to fill up for the eight. This one only needs two, oxygen needs two to fill up for the eight. And then um, nitrogen needs three to fill up, going this direction. So three electrons to fill up. So what is the probable formula of fluoride? You're gonna need three, need three of these, basically. So three of these to fill up, and nitrogen needs three, so. Um, NF3. That was a little tricky. Which of the following statements best explains why four orbitals fills before the 3D? Four orbital, um, S orbitals, S means spherical, fills before the 3D, and D is kind of looks like a cross. So it says electron repulsion causes energy to overlap between electron cells. I'm not really sure of this one. So, you know, you decide about that one. Look it up. Which of the following atoms would you expect, let's get this in here, right? Um, would, you, would you expect to have the smallest radius? And so, um, the smallest radius, okay, the radius goes I drew this picture here so you can see the picture. I hope on there, good. See that picture? So you have small, go ahead and draw this, small to large to small. That's how it goes. The radius goes, it always gets bigger as it goes down the column, and as it goes across, it gets smaller. That's to find out the smallest. And so um, which of the following atoms would you expect to be the smallest? And so you have S, R, G, S, and A, L. And I wrote down here, so um, here's S, R here is in the 12th column. And then uh, G, G, E is in the 14th column. And um, A, L is in the 13th column. And S is in the 16th column. So which one would be the smallest? Well, it goes from large, from large to small, right? So the one that's clear over on the, Right side, which would be the 16th column, would be the answer. So C, S. This 
smallest would be S. Because you, all you do is plot them in which, which um, columns they are, 12, 14, 13, and 16, with this way to find out which one is the smallest. True, false. When an element is vaporized and heated in a flame or an electric arc, the light emitted forms a continuous spectrum. No, it doesn't form a... Con if, it's if it goes through a prism, it'll be continuous. But when it's heated, it goes through and has a line spectrum that kind of has different lights at different, li different intervals like that. It's called a line spectrum. So that's a false one. Mm -hmm. The theory that regards light as consisted of tiny packets of energy that have characteristics of both particles and waves is the matter wave. No, this is called quantum. It's called quantum, quantum physics or quantum, you know, those packets. Okay, um, the high points, the high points of a wave are called crests. Yeah, here's a wave, top or crest, bottom or troughs. So, number 40, the arrangement of all forms of electromagnetic radiation in um, order of frequency and wavelength is the electromagnetic spectrum. Yep, all the waves of electromagnetic radiation forms a big spectrum. Remember, from gamma, from the fastest being the gamma and the X-rays and the visible light or ultraviolet light, light then visible light, and then goes to um, on to on as you go on gets bigger waves all the way over to radio waves and high those waves. What from visible to microwaves to radio waves. So forty one. Two, okay, oh, to three sig figs, the speed of light in a vacuum. So is, and they said it is this, where in the world did they get that number? Weird. It's actually, it, it's actually, they probably got it from 182,000 um, miles per second, but that does not figure into this. You know, they don't want that. So they have, basically have a 3.00 times 10 to the 8. eight. This, is, this is the answer. That's how fast light travels, huh? Per second, 3.00 times 10 to the eighth. The low points of a wave are called what? Valleys, they're not called valleys, but they're called troughs, those low troughs. So that's a false one. 43, the number of complete waves that pass by a point in a given time is the amplitude. No, the number that pass by are what? The frequency, so this is false too. The group of elements uh, referred to as salt formers because they commonly react with metals to form salt are the halogens. Nope, halogens are oxygen containers. So they're called halogens. Halogens are salt. Element in the same column of a periodic table belong to the same period. No, the columns are the groups and the periods go across. So false group. The distance between two corresponding corresponding point, points on a successive wave is called the wavelength. Um, true. So it's the wavelength, the wave you have a wave like here, and between this crest and this, this uh, crest would be your wavelength. So that's true. 47. Oxygen and sulfur. Okay, these are matching. Now just think, there's key words in these. Oxygen and sulfur both form binary compounds with hydrogen and water. Um, plus hydrogen sulfide. They also form compounds methanol and methanexrol. So which one of these does it match? This is just a normal equation. So if you go through all of them, none of them match except for a normal periodic law, right? An element, number 48, an element will be attracted by a magnet if atoms of the element can contain unpaired. That's the word unpaired. One of those laws has to do with, with being uh, unpaired, because you pair, what happens? The single ones are used first before the pair, right? So what is that unpaired rule? Hun's rule, unpaired rule. Let's finish this up here. It's gonna go a little bit over time, but I think we'll be fine. Each orbital in an atom can hold no more than two electrons. Um, they can't hold m more than two electrons, one with a spin and the spin, because what? Well, because they can't, they cannot have um, one electron 
cannot have all four quantums together. So you call this basically the exclusion principle, Pauli exclusion principle. A chemist is predicting the electron configuration of an element by distributing um, electrons into orbitals until all the electrons are used. He determined that the 6p subshell must be completely filled before any electrons are placed in higher energy 7 subshells. Well, what do you call this? It's building up. You're building up those subshells sub uh, and shells, and building up is off ball, right? Number 51, a scientist is measuring the momentum of electrons produced in a cathode. However, she noticed that the more accurately she determines the momentum of electrons, the less, the less um, she can be certain of their position. She's not certain, so what does she call this? Uncertainty principle. They never can be certain. Momentum and um, where it's located position can never be found together. Uncertain. Last question here, and you can do this yourself too. Please don't put down just what I put, but it says compare the Rutherford's model, the Bohr's model, and the Born's model. The Rutherford's are the first model. What's the Rutherford? In the Rutherford, the Rutherford, in the, the Rutherford has, is like a planetary model where all the electrons are going, each electron is going around the orbit just like a little planet. But it can't do that because if they kept doing that, the energy level would um, uh, be, be less and less until it crashed into the nucleus. So it didn't work. So um, basically it, it would fail. In the Bohr's model, which was the next model, the guy had Bohr, he, he took the Rutherford model, but he said, no, um, they don't go around, the, they don't just go around in their own orbits. They have electron uh, energy levels, little packets. They go by packets. So the electrons are in packets, which are egg, uh, um, energy levels called quantums. And these quantums, these little energy packets, they stay together in their energy level and go and they orbit around the nucleus. So, but the problem with Bohr's, there was a problem with Rutherford, the problem with Bohr's is basically that Bohr's, um, he only could figure out the hydrogen atom. He couldn't figure out, he, he used the spectrum that, that, um, that for that element, but he only could use it, with, he only could prove it with the hydrogen atom. So in Borns, the last guy, Borns, Borns, he figured that yes, all of, he took both of these guys and everything and he, and he took them, um, that he believed that electrons are moving in these unpredictable clouds of dots. And they're not really um, delineated together, you know, um, but they're just in a cloud and that cloud has the group and then as they, they go around in the cloud, they are more um, together. So the Borns is the more modern. So anyway, so that's my take on it. So you can write this in your own words, please. Okay, that's it.